Good morning. My name is Paul Bianconi. And I'm Anna Headley. And we are the project managers for this year's Senior Capstone Design Project. We would like to thank the faculty, our family, friends, co-workers, and engineering professionals for coming and spending the next three action-packed hours with us. Without your support, we would not be here today, and we are very grateful. Senior Capstone Design is a project conducted by civil engineering seniors every year. In order to produce an adequate capstone design, our team needed to utilize the knowledge gained through our course of learning over the last eight semesters. The facets of civil engineering incorporated in the capstone design project are as follows. Structural, water resources, site civil, transportation, geotechnical, and environment. Listed above are the technical courses each student needed to complete before participating in senior capstone design. These courses enabled the team to apply our knowledge in order for to, to produce an actual design. Each course is incorporated in at least one of the five facets of civil engineering. Those are transportation, structural, geotechnical, site civil, and environmental. Before we continue, we'd like to take a few moments to thank the professionals who took time out of their busy days to assist us with the project. The transportation mentor was Beth Hunt of LJB. The site civil mentor was Tom McCrate of McCrate Consultants. The structural mentor was Ben Vandeway of Shaw and Meyer. The environmental mentor was Nadia Turk of Woolbert. And the geotechnical mentor was Mark Salveter of Professional Service Industries. And last, but certainly not least, Paul and I would like to extend a special thank you to Kevin McCormick of Ferguson Construction for all of his guidance and assistance during the project. We would also like to thank Professor Tim Wilbers and his ASI 341 class for all of their hard work in producing the video that you will see shortly. Now traditionally, the Senior Capstone Design Project is modeled after a project already occurring in the Dayton area. However, due to lack of projects and the Dayton, Dayton retained our class's focus, this year's client is none other than our own Dr. Donald Chase, the head of the Civil Engineering Department. Dr. Chase gave us the challenging and fun task of designing a NASCAR stadium to be located in central Ohio. We have named that facility Buckeye Motor Speedway. In order to produce a challenging project, Dr. Chase stipulated the following requirements for our facility. A NASCAR Sprint Cup all blank track, amenities for fans to visit throughout the year to maximize profit, lead certification for the hotel and casino, a safe environment for fans and visitors, adequate parking that fulfill ADA requirements, an ease of traffic for entering and exiting on race day, and an unforgettable fan experience. All of these aspects were incorporated in our design of Buckeye Motor Speedway. For those who may not follow NASCAR, the organization has an annual revenue of approximately $3 billion and a yearly attendance of nearly 4 million fans. <coughs> to put that in perspective, the National Football League has a yearly revenue of about $9 billion and a yearly attendance of approximately 16 million fans nationwide. The Sprint Cup Series is NASCAR's premier series for competition. This year, 23 tracks nationwide, all very different, and ranging in length from one half to two and a half miles, will host the 36 races in the series. A typical weekend can include events all three days, with the Sprint Cup Series not being run until Sunday. This makes the camping and tailgating capabilities of our complex that much more important. Due to the unique characteristics of NASCAR, such as the noise generated during races and the space needed for the camping and tailgating facilities, it was important to find a location that was rural, but close to major cities, adjacent to major highways and roads, and sparsely populated so as to displace the fewest people possible. We chose a location near Mount Sterling, which is in Madison County. It is close to both Dayton and Columbus, and immediately adjacent to I-71 and State Route 56. As you can see, the location chosen is mostly farmland currently, so there is very little around to be adversely affected by the addition of the complex. 
Now I'd like to show a short video detailing what our complex would look like if it were actually to be built. As I mentioned, the site is currently mostly farmland. It is bordered to the east by State Route 56, to the south by County Road 21, which is also known as Junk Road. I-71, seen here, also runs per or perpendicular to State Route 56. This makes traffic entering and exiting our site very easy. Combined, these roads provide access from Dayton, Columbus, and Cincinnati, as well as farther away places like Indianapolis, Cleveland, and Kentucky. As you can see, there are several farms and a business located on our site, which will be discussed later in greater detail by Site Civil. Now we would like to focus on the Interstate 71 State Route 56 interchange. What you see here is the existing configuration of both the interchange and the I-71 overpass bridge. There are two entrance and exit ramps that are one lane each. Now in order to facilitate the influx of traffic on race days, many upgrades need to be conducted on both the bridge and the roads. As you can see, the bridge has been widened to five lanes to improve capacity and strength. Both I-71 and State Route 56 have also been widened to accommodate the influx of traffic. Moving away from the interchange, you can see an overview of the site as it currently stands. As you can see, the track and grandstands are located in the approximate middle of the site. Access roads will lead in from both State Route 56 and Junk Road. These will allow access to the parking, camping, operations building, hotel, and of course the track. As you can see, the track is actually below grade, necessitating a tunnel for access to the infield. This will be discussed in greater detail by both Site Civil and Transpo. As we pan over the site, features such as the hotel parking lot and the larger lot, which is paved for handicap and VIP parking, can both be seen. The NASCAR merchandising area has been located to the north of the site to allow easier access for any people who are camping or tailgating during the weekend. <coughs> on the infield. You can see the tunnel in the top right corner. This tunnel provides an entrance for both drivers and pedestrians to the infield for race day viewing. In the lower half of the screen, you can see both pit road as well as 43 pull-through garages for racers on race day. Now to the left of the screen, you can see the hotel with two adjacent helipads. These will be used in case of emergencies on, ra on race day when fans or drivers need to be life flooded. Also, on the inside of the track, you can see a safety barrier, which is there to protect viewers in the infield and for racers. Now in the infield, you can see the detention basin, which is uh, displayed by the white circle. This will be discussed by the site civil group later on. There's also a driver's lounge, which will be used um, by drivers on race day. As you can see, the grandstands encompass half of the track and hold approximately 110,000 fans. There are both an upper and lower level, as well as a mezzanine that holds concessions, suites, and press boxes. The areas shaded in the darker brown are aisles for fans to access their seats. Moving around to focus on the hotel, you can see the green room, which the environmental group will discuss later. This shot shows the typical room layout for the third, fourth, and fifth floors. There are approximately 90 rooms per floor in this configuration with the elevator bays in the middle. The second floor contains the restaurants, conference rooms, and office space for any guests and visitors, both on and off race days, as well as access to the party deck. The ground floor has the casino, safe, 
front desk and storage for the hotel, as well as access to and from the parking lot. As you move around to the front or to the side of the hotel that faces the track, you can see a better view of the party deck as well as the balconies that overlook each room. The party deck can be used for general viewing during races and includes access to the hotel, restaurants, and bars. The balconies provide more private viewing experience for any guests who would prefer to watch the race that way. As you pan back out, you can once again see the full scope of, our, of the project our team undertook and the amount of effort it required. Once again, we'd like to thank Professor Wilbers and his class for making this rendering video possible. So our design groups were divided to represent the five facets of civil engineering. Each team consisted of a team leader and several team members. This project required that all teams collaborate effectively in order to produce a successful design deliverable. Your hard work beginning in October with the architectural design phase, this year's senior design team has produced a successful design for Buckeye Motor Speedway. This year, the structural team was led by Andrew Dorfler. The transportation team was led by Jake Berkey. The environmental team was led by Kathy Junlin. The geotechnical team was led by Don Wilson. And now, we'd like to turn it over to Alec Goodall and the site civil team for their presentation. Thank you, Ian Paul. I'm Alec Goodall and I'm the site civil team leader. I'd now like to introduce my group and what they will be presenting. The overview and demolition plan will be presented by myself, redeveloped site conditions, Evan Mickey, site grading, Sarah Hartman, parking area stormwater management, Christy Rasso, stadium stormwater management, Zach Borgers, water demand analysis, Jared White, utilities management, Kyle Sloan, and we'd like to give a special thanks to our mentor, Thomas McCrae from McCrae Consultants for helping us throughout this project. The site civil team is responsible for aspects of the project that have to do with site development. We're responsible for examining the site conditions and determining the work needed. A demolition plan evaluates the structures that need to be removed and relocated from the site. Pre-developed site conditions are evaluated to determine the initial rainfall runoff from a given storm event. Site grading allows the proper drainage of the site and determine the amount of soil that must be moved on or off site. Post-developed conditions are evaluated to see the change in rainfall runoff and how that differs from the pre-developed conditions. Stormwater management ensures that the post-developed rainfall runoff conditions match the pre-developed rainfall runoff conditions. Sanitary sewer consists of moving water, wastewater off-site to a treatment facility. Water distribution allows us to bring potable water on-site. Utilities include any water pipes, sanitary sewer pipes, stormwater pipes, natural gas lines, electric connections, and communications required for the site. The existing site conditions uh, consist of primarily row crops with generally poor soil conditions. It is sparsely populated with one to two story residential homes, barns consisting of wooden frames, and some with steel frames and concrete slabs, and a variety of grain silos. There are also small isolated areas that have trees and vegetation. A demolition plan must be executed in order to facilitate the construction of parking lots and the stadium. Existing structures and vegetation must be removed and relocated to facilitate the construction on site. The red X's shown here uh, are not exact locations but represent the 16 residential homes that must be relocated on the site. The yellow X's also are not exact locations but represent the seven, 21 barns and seven grain silos that must be removed. Green and Sons Equipment Rental rents small farm equipment and machinery and must be relocated. And there are small areas of vegetation scattered around the site and must be removed. The notes for the demolition plan are as follows. The propane tanks must be removed by the propane provider. 
Septic tanks will be pumped and capped to ease any environmental issues that may arise, and all applicable materials from the demolition and construction will be recycled or reused to satisfy the lead construction and demolition waste management planning prerequisite and credit. And now I'd like to introduce Evan Mickey, who will be discussing the pre-developed site conditions. Thank you, Alec. So our total site facility is found to have an acreage of 805. And because of this large size, we decided to break it up into six different watershed areas. As you can see on the map, represented with the yellow and green colors, are the watersheds for the north and west camping areas. The orange, pink, and light blue areas represent the watershed areas covered by, <coughs> by various parking lots throughout the site. And in the center of the map is the, water, is the stadium watershed, which I will discuss first. The stadium watershed will be occupied by the grandstands, the track, and the infield of the track upon construction. This 61-acre area is covered with straight row crops with a hydrologic soil group of D. This soil group corresponds to a poor condition soil. And soils have been classified by the National Resources Conservation Service based on the depth, texture, organic matter content, and infiltration rate. Based on a soil's condition, a curve number can be associated with said soil. And a curve number is an empirical parameter used for predicting direct runoff of excess rainfall. Here you can see another picture of our site and the oval there represents the approximate area of our stadium watershed. And I found this area to have a curve number of 91. The next important uh, piece of information you need, to, you need to consider for a watershed is the watershed's time of concentration. And this is the time needed for water to flow from the most remote point in a watershed to the watershed outlet. And this is a function of the topography, geology, land use, and the land use within the watershed. For the stadium site, we found the time of concentration to be 20.8 minutes. The five parking and camping watershed areas were all analyzed as one single large watershed. And this is due to the similar land characteristics within each area, and also to come up with a conservative estimate for the time of concentration used for these areas. The total area of the parking and camping areas was found to be 744 acres, with a time of concentration of 1.53 hours, and again, a curve number of 91. As for the stormwater management design, each of the five watersheds were analyzed individually, and this was done to create a drainage system specifically tailored to each area, which will be discussed later. And next is Sarah Hardman to talk about site grading. Thank you, Evan. Grading is the movement of earth to create a desired slope for drainage, utility placement, accessibility, and other components of the site. The existing grade of our site is relatively flat, averaging a 1% slope and sloping from the northwest corner to the southeast corner of the property with a small portion of the southwest corner of the property sloping south towards Bradford Creek. When grading the site, the site civil team had to consider several different things, including the existing conditions, the stormwater management, pedestrian accessibility, a cut and fill soil balance, and ADA requirements, or Americans for Disabilities Act. This states that a maximum of one to 48 cross slope can be used. In other words, a slope of a maximum 2% running perpendicular to the path of travel can be used. The team decided on a bowl-shaped track design with a berm built around the track that the grandstands could be built into. The top of the berm sits at an elevation of 980 feet, with the inner elevation of the track at 915 feet, and the outer edge of the track at 924 feet. Preferred parking, as well as ADA parking in the west, and the merchandising area to the north, were graded at a maximum of 1.5% slope. Elsewhere, the parking is graded anywhere from 1 to 4% slope. The west parking area slopes west away from the track. 
while the east parking slopes east and south. Due to its proximity to the track, a retaining wall will be required behind the hotel, which should set a finish floor elevation of 968 feet. The adjacent parking area will be graded at a 1% slope. The camping areas to the north and west of the site were graded to reflect existing topography and have much lesser slopes of a quarter to 1%. Now, Christy Rasa will talk about parking area stormwater management. Thank you, Sarah. Stormwater management is the collection of stormwater into drainage structures that transport their water offsite. These structures control the quantity, quality, timing, and distribution of the runoff. First, our team needed to determine if an existing storm sewer system was present on site. Since the existing site is open farmland with a few houses, there are no storm sewer systems on the majority of the site. The only existing structures are small pipe culverts that are part of the roadside drainage ditches along Route 56 and Junk Road. The layout of the proposed storm sewer system is shown here in green. The stadium is at the highest elevation on site, so all of the runoff flows away from the stadium and hotel. A series of curb inlets and catch basins collect the water and transport it through the concrete pipes, which eventually outlets into Bradford Creek. The storm sewer system consists of approximately 83,000 feet of pipe, varying in sizes from 12 inches up to 96 inches, and has a total of 454 sewer structures, which include catch basins, curb inlets, manholes, and head walls. Here's a closer view of the west and east parking areas. Both areas operate in the same manner, with water flowing away from the stadium and then discharging into the large pipe underneath the loop access road. These two large pipes transport the water south and eventually outlet into the creek. Here is the location of the two pipe outlets into the creek, with the pipe drain in the west area being 84 inches and the pipe drain in the east being 96 inches. To design the system, the rational method was used. The rational method calculates the peak flow rate in each pipe and is dependent upon a runoff coefficient, a rainfall intensity value, and the drainage area. The design storm used was the 10% annual chance storm. To, de to determine the actual size of the pipe, Manning's equation was used and is dependent upon the peak flow rate, which was found in the rational method, and Manning's roughness coefficient, and the longitudinal slope of the pipe. In the two camping areas, rather than using concrete pipes, roadside drainage ditches were used, were designed along the camp access roads. In the north area, outlets into the existing ditch on Route 56, and the west area outlets into the creek. Another part of stormwater management is to determine whether detention is required on site. Detention basins collect stormwater and release it at a controlled rate to prevent flooding of downstream areas, and it is needed if the post-developed peak runoff is greater than the pre-developed peak runoff. This table shows that the post-developed runoff decreased by 16% compared to the pre-developed runoff. Therefore, detention is not needed outside of the stadium. The decrease in runoff is due to the post-developed land uses. The grass in the camping areas and grass creek in the parking lots, which will be discussed later by the environmental group, have higher infiltration rates than the existing row crops, and therefore results in a lower post-developed composite curve number. And now Zach Borchers will talk to you about the stadium stormwater management. Thank you, Christy. Uh, one of the first things when doing a stormwater analysis is determining the watershed characteristics. Uh, as you can see here, these are the post-developed conditions. We have nine and a half acres of uh, just grandstand area, 49 and a half acres of track and infield, and a two-acre dry detention basin, uh, which will be discussed later. Uh, each, of the, each of the areas has an associated curve number, uh, and in order to find your composite curve number, you can see the equation listed up there, uh, and our composite curve number was 98, and which led to a time of concentration of 18.1 minutes for the uh, stadium. The critical storm method was then used per the Franklin County Stormwater Drainage Manual. 
Um, this compares percent increase in runoff volume from a 100% annual chance event or a one-year storm for uh, post and pre-developed conditions. Our track had a 44% increase in runoff, uh, which corresponds to the 20% annual chance storm event or a five-year storm. Uh, each pipe that is used for stormwater conveyance within the track is sized using this variation of Manning's equation discussed previously. This slide shows the layout of the stormwater conveyance system. Piping routes run off from the grandstands area to the detention basin, run off from the pit road area, through a trench drain into oil water separators, and into the detention basin, as well as run off from the infield, which, becomes, which because of the bowl shape, runs into the detention basin as overland flow. After the required pipe diameters were calculated using the Manning's equation, nominal pipe diameters were selected as seen here based upon their uh, associated peak flows. Because the post-developed uh, runoff exceeded our pre-developed runoff, detention is required inside the track. Uh, discharge from the basin is handled by the pump because of the elevation difference between the river and the detention basin, as well as the surrounding berm that uh, would put about 100 feet of dirt on top of any pipe trying to leave uh, the stadium. The discharge rate from the basin is nine cubic feet per second, which for a pump is about 4,000 gallons per minute, and the basin can hold approximately 800,000 cubic feet of water. Uh, a 1% annual chance storm event was, analysis was conducted, and it resulted in one foot of freeboard as required by the Franklin County Stormwater Drainage Manual. Next it is Jared White to talk about the water demand analysis. Thank you, Zach. So now that we just discussed removing all that storm water from the site, we now have to bring even more water onto the site. Um, this is this needs to be potable water tested to primary drinking water standards, and it's delivered to the customers via plumbing fixtures, which includes any shower heads. Uh, faucets or washing machines, what have you. The Ohio Building Code dictates required number of fixtures per certain number of people for different kinds of facilities. So we used uh, expected number of customers for each type of building, and that was uh, that was summed to get the total number of each kind of fixture for a different kind of for the different buildings, which you can see on the screen there. Now we live in a time where water conservation and sustainability are very necessary design considerations. So it's kind of a no-brainer to use high-efficiency fixtures throughout our site. Uh, this was done in close collaboration with the environmental team, and we were actually able to reduce water usage by 47% compared to LEED standards. You'll hear more about LEED and further measures taken to reduce water consumption later in this presentation. Now the total number of fixtures can be multiplied by the flow per fixture to get a maximum possible flow that the site could experience. However, it's extremely unlikely that those conditions would actually take place. So the International Plumbing Code was consulted to determine reductions in design flow. Now, as, as you increase the number of fixtures, it's even more unlikely that all of them would be running at once. So number of fixtures is factored into uh, finding out that determined design flow. This was done on a per building basis and this summed up to uh, 730 gallons per minute, which equates to 1.05 million gallons per day. An additional analysis was run to confirm that daily usage. And this was uh, based on the EPA numbers, which provides recommended amounts of water to account for per person for different kinds of facilities. And that was summed to equate to 1.02 million gallons per day, which upwards for upwards of uh, 110,000 customers is pretty close, 30,000 gallons off. On top of that, fire flow demands need to be accounted for as well. Our mentor recommended using a sprinkler system throughout the facilities, and also the insurance services office code was uh, was consulted to determine a fire flow of 1,000 gallons per minute. That has to be able to sustain itself for 30 minutes, so that equates to another 30,000 gallons that we have to account for. All that considered, we determined a maximum conservative daily usage of 1.1 million gallons per day for race events, and then for off-season events, it would be about 300,000 gall 300, gallons per day as a maximum. 
Now how do we, provide, now how do we get that water to the site itself? Uh, most of the area residents and facilities use underground wells to provide their water. That was not feasible for our site due to the magnitude of our water demand. Um, so we looked at local municipalities and tried to tap into, uh, to tap into their existing system. And London, Ohio actually provided the most sound infrastructure to tap into. Now London's system uses an average of 1 million gallons per day. Their maximum usage, which would likely occur over the summer, is 1.2, and their treatment plant is rated at 1.3 million gallons a day. So obviously we cannot get all this water from them on any given day. Therefore, a storage tank is needed. And the reason we went with a storage tank and not completely upgrade their infrastructure is because it's not economical to upgrade their, their water distribution system to provide that, that amount of water for events that would only take place once or twice a month. However, it would be desirable to upgrade their infrastructure with minor upgrades to get them to about 1.5 or 1.6 million gallons per day. So we would need an on-site 1.5 million gallon elevated storage tank uh, to house enough water to be able to provide that demand for a weekend race event. Um, it is desirable to pull 250,000 gallons per day from the London system so that would be able to fill the, the water tank in six days. Um, this would have to be done in close uh, collaboration between our site utility manager and the London superintendent of water. Now we don't want to pump that water from the London system and overwhelm their pumping stations and whatnot. So we did a diurnal curve analysis, which basically multiplies factors times an average to map out actual hourly usages throughout a given day. And we created a baseline, which is that straight line across the screen that you see and we would pump from the existing system whenever the actual usage is below that baseline. And I give you Kyle Stone to talk about on-site utility management. Thank you, Jared. The proposed water distribution system was designed under the assumption that the proposed tie location will provide at least 55 PSI for the projected flow rates that Jared had just mentioned. This system, along with the proposed sanitary sewer system, was designed according to the 2012 edition of the 10 states' recommended standards for water works. Pipes for both systems were placed at least 5 feet away from roadways and at least 15 feet away from other pipelines when possible. In addition, paved parking areas were avoided in order to ease construction and maintenance. Pipe lengths were minimized in the design of both systems in order to alleviate costs. The water distribution system was designed to operate during two different scenarios. The first scenario is shown, and during this first scenario, the water will flow from the east side to the west until it reaches an elevated water storage tank of 150 feet. The tank will be filled prior to race day and will flow from the tank to the 16-inch mains represented by the dark blue lines and eventually to the 8-inch to 10-inch lines represented by the light blue path. This design incorporates a loop system in order to increase efficiency. During the off-season, or non-race days, the water will bypass the storage tank and flow from north to south until it reaches the hotel, casino, and office building. The pipes were sized according to the race day scenarios using maximum daily demands for the grandstands and normal design flow rates for the rest of the buildings. Fire flows were also applied during this scenario, <coughs> and uh, pipes were also sized using EPA net software, which is software provided by the Environmental Protection In all, the proposed system contains approximately 19,500 feet of ductile iron pipe with pipe sizes ranging from 8 to 16 inches in diameter. Now, the sanitary sewer network uh, was designed as a gravity-fed system and pipes were sized according to a variation of Manning's equation. On the east side, the water will flow from the hotel, casino, and office buildings through 8-inch pipes represented by the, or the orange lines and they'll connect to a larger series of pipes ranging in size from 12 to 18 inches in diameter. These pipes are shown by the dark brown ones. And eventually, this, this wastewater will drain to the on-site wastewater treatment plant as well. No sanitary sewer pipes were designed to run underneath the track due to such a large uh, variation in elevation between the inside elevation of the track and the outside elevation of the track. Therefore, a holding tank was placed in the infield in order to provide wastewater storage for the hospital and the driver's lounge. This tank will be pumped after race days. On the west side of the system, the wastewater 
will flow from the camping restrooms and grandstands and will flow from north to south until it reaches the on-site wastewater treatment plant. And the environmental group will discuss this in detail a little bit later. In all, this proposed system contains approximately 11,500 feet of PVC pipe with pipe sizes ranging from 8 to 18 inches in diameter. Some additional utilities to be considered include elect electric, gas, and cable, and the tie-in points must be located prior to construction. Currently, the existing structures on site utilize propane tanks, um, therefore new gas pipelines will need to be installed, and natural gas for the proposed site will be provided by the local natural gas contract. Currently, existing power is fed to the uh, site by power lines, and electric for the proposed site will be supplied to these lines and provided by the elect local electric supply. Finally, cable will need to be run to the office building, hotel casino, hospital, driver's lounge, and grandstands in order to provide necessary communication features for race days in the office building. Now I'll turn it over to the transportation group leader, Jake Thank you, Jake. Thank you, Tom. Our goals as the transportation group for this project were to first improve existing infrastructure and highways. Uh, we did this first by designing for the daily traffic to the hotel and casino and making any expansions necessary. And then we made any other practical ex expansions we deemed necessary for race day traffic. Uh, we also wanted to design on-site infrastructure, uh, both entrances and access roads to transport fans to their destination on site, as well as parking that would be able to handle race day volumes, uh, in addition to uh, special parking lots for the hotel and casino, as well as the operations building. We also designed services for the track and infield. Uh, when doing this, we had to consider several NASCAR specifications. Uh, the tasks for our group, I will discuss the scope of work. Jamie Gross will discuss improvements to existing highways. Brian Gitzinger will talk about interchange improvements. TJ Bernard will talk about design of on-site access roads. Tyler Toby will cover parking lot and pavement design. And Brian Lassie will discuss track and infield design. And again, we'd like to thank our mentor, Beth Hunt, from LJB for all of her help, as well as Larry Sack from LJB who helped us with high, highway design, and Steve Swift from Kentucky Motor Speedway who informed us about a lot of NASCAR specifications. Our scope of work, number one, was to improve existing highways. Uh, we expanded Interstate 71 to the north and the south, as we predict that a lot of traffic will come from Columbus and Cincinnati. State Route 56 will be expanded up from the Interstate 71 to the site, as well as to the north, as we expect a significant amount of traffic to come down from Interstate 70. And Junk Road to the south of the site will be upgraded, as there will be an entrance coming off of this road as well. Our second thing is to improve the interchange of Interstate 71 to State Route 56, as you see here on the southeast side of the site. Our third thing is to design on-site entrances and access roads. We will design multiple entrances so that fans coming from different directions or going to different destinations on site may enter at different locations. And we will design access roads to give fans access to wherever on the site they want to, uh, to access. Our fourth item is parking lots. Uh, we design parking to handle the traffic volumes for race day. We also design special parking lots for the hotel and casino and operations building and designated grass areas for camping around the outside of the site as you see here. This scope item was track and infield design. Uh, we designed planning profile for the track itself, as well as the pavement design for the track. Uh, we also designed a planning profile for pit road and pavement for pit road, and we designed pavement for all the other asphalt paving throughout the infield, so that they would be able to handle the weight of haulers brought in by the racers. Our final scope item was signage and lighting. Uh, we designed permanent signage. This included relocating and replacing existing signage along the highways that were expanded. Uh, we also added new signage, both due to expansions and also on-site, due to the roads we designed on-site. Uh, when designing the signage, we had to assure adequate times for vehicles to view and react to the signage, and also design special informative signage to help direct fans to their destination on-site. Uh, we also designed a permanent lighting plan. Uh, we decided that permanent lighting would be needed for the hotel and casino parking lot, as well as the main entrance to the hotel and casino as if the opening around. Uh, we specified a light pool from the Ohio Department of Transportation and chose locations for the lighting based on information 
on spacing that was needed for the lighting given to us by the environmental team. And with that, I will turn it over to Jamie Gross, who will talk about improvements to existing highways. <coughs> Thank you, Jake. First, I, as Jake said, we had to improve uh, Interstate 71, State Route 56, and Route Road. I-71 is will be taken from a four-lane highway to a six-lane highway, and that was determined from ADT counts based on a 20-year projection. It will also include two exit and entry lanes, one of which will be an inter-exit only, and one will be a merge lane. It will also consist of 10-foot shoulders. Uh, for State Route 56, uh, it's currently a two-lane highway, and we're taking it to a five-lane highway with a reversible lane, and it'll have 10-foot shoulders, 14-foot lanes, and it has several entrances to the track off of it. For Junk Road, it's currently a two-lane road, uh, which we have designed to be a three-lane road, which will add a reversible lane and also have wide shoulders and one of the entrances to the track. Uh, ADT is the average daily traffic, and that's the average traffic to pass a specific point during the day. Uh, for Interstate 71, our current the existing ADT is 34,250 vehicles per day, and for State Route 56 is 4,330 vehicles per day. And both of those numbers came from ODOT's website. Uh, on race day, we expect an additional 41,000 vehicles, 37,000 of which are going to be cars, and 4,000 are going to be multi-axle vehicles. Uh, on an average day, we expect to see 1,600 vehicles per day uh, visiting the hotel and casino. For signal warrants, these are the eight signal warrants that we have to look at when we're trying to decide if we need to add a traffic signal or not. Uh, we're conducting warrants along State Route 56 at both entry and exit intersections <laughs> of 71 at Junk Road and to the main entrance of the track. Uh, from our knowledge of the signal warrants, we decided that warrants four through nine were not needed because our site does not meet the requirements. Uh, from our analysis, we determined that warrants one and two were met at both entry, exit, ramp, intersections, and at the main entrance along 56. And because these signal warrants were met, uh, we are going to put a traffic signal at these three intersections. We will not be putting one at Jump Road. Uh, next, Brian Kitzinger will discuss interchange improvements. Thank you, Jamie. The I-71 State Route 56 interchange is currently a diamond shape. This shape will be maintained as it is ODOT's recommended design for an interchange involving a major and a minor roadway. The top of ramp intersections will be upgraded from two-way stops to traffic signals based on the signal warrant analysis James spoke about. State Route 56 overpass and elevated intersections will remain supported by earthen embankments. The upgraded design will include the following modifications. All ramps will be expanded from one to two lanes wide. Exit lanes along I 71 will be lengthened to allow additional storage. Entrance ramps will be designed to ensure safe merging at the higher 70 mile per hour design speed. The upgraded design <coughs> adheres to ODOT's Volume 1 Highway Design Standards. An additional consideration for the top of ramp intersections was intersection site distance. 
In this case, ISD is the clear, unobstructed view required at the top of the ramp in order to safely pull out and cross State Route 56 traffic. Provided here is a plan view design drawing. This drawing shows a typical exit ramp with two curves. The first curve is designed for 60 miles per hour with a radius of 1,275 feet. The second curve is designed for 35 miles per hour with a radius of 314 feet. Provided here is a design cross-section drawing. The first drawing shows a typical two-lane on earthen, two-lane ramp on earthen and bare. And the second drawing shows a typical exit or entrance lane alongside the I-71 line. Now I'll turn it over to TJ to talk about on-site access rules. Thank you, Brian. The access roads onto and around the track property were designed to allow motorists to park their vehicles in a quick and safe manner. There are five entrances off of State Route 56 and Jock Road onto the Buckeye Motor Speedway property. The main entrance and the administration building entrance will be the only entrance open all year long. All of the roads on the track property were named after either famous Ohio race car drivers or relate somehow to the speedway. The far north entrance will be used for campers only. The campers are expected to come throughout the week prior to a race weekend. In addition to campers, there will be a large volume of traffic expected on race day. We expect 37,000 cars to access the track property on race day. 9,000 of these cars are expected to come from the north on State Route 56 and use this entrance, which we have called Dave Blaine Drive. The rest of the 28,000 cars are expected to come from Interstate 71 and enter from the south on State Route 56. Half of these cars will be led down Junk Road, while the other half will continue north on State Route 56 and use the main entrance. This main entrance will lead to Victory Lane, which we have called Victory Lane because it's in line with the start-finish line of the front stretch of the speedway. Victory Lane will also be used to bring motorists to the Checker Flake Hotel and Casino during the uh, non-race days throughout the year. The other entrance open all year long is this road here called Sam Horse Junior Drive. This drive will allow motorists to access the administration building throughout the year. The 14,000 cars that are led down Junk Road we use this entrance down this drive called Jack Hewitt Drive. This drive also goes, leads to the path that will lead to the tunnel that goes underneath the track and into the infield. Finally, we designed a loop road around the track property called Buckeye Motor Speedway Drive. This will allow fans to access the various parking lots throughout the track property and also be used as a route for the tram system to bring fans to their desired location on race day. While designing these roads, there were several design criteria we had considered. Horizontal curves is what you would see when looking down on the layout of the roadway. The vertical alignment, which is any elevation change in the road, along with the cross-section design. One of the main design criteria in the horizontal curve is the minimum curve radius. This is a function of the vehicle speed, super elevation, which is essentially banking in the roadway, the side friction factor, which changes with, this, uh, with the uh, velocity of the car. There are several horizontal curves in design. A simple curve is just made of one simple radius, a compound curve, which has two or more radii, and a spiral curve, which has a changing degree of curvature to allow for more smooth access into and out of the curve. The vertical alignment consists of a crest curve, which is when a roadway comes to a peak. The design criteria for the crest curve is stop and sight distance and comfort. It's, uh, the minimum length of the crest curve is a function of both the stop and sight distance <coughs> and the change of grade. The side curve is when a curve when the road comes to a valley. The main design criteria for a side curve is the headlight sight distance so the driver can see far enough in the dark to have ample time to stop. Also, the comfort and general appearance of a side curve is an important design criteria to consider. The side curve is also a function of the change of grid and stop and sight distance. 
The cross section design of the roadways on the track property. The main entrance will be four lanes wide. All the other roads will be three lanes. They'll all be 12 foot, lane, 12 foot wide lanes. And the lanes will be reversible so that on traffic race day, traffic can all flow in the same direction to allow for a smooth flow. There'll be six inch stabilized aggregate shoulder to allow for uh, support of the roadway, along with the 0.02 feet per foot cross load or crown in the roadway to allow for adequate drainage of the stormwater. I'll now hand over to Tyler Toby to talk about design of parking lots. Thanks, TJ. The goal of parking lot design is to allow for an adequate amount of parking for the maximum amount of guests while minimizing the distance to the entrance. We also have to allow for adequate parking for handicapped citizens as well in the process while minim minimizing their walking distance as well. One final goal of parking lot design is to gain lead points through things such as using alternate materials for the pavement. For the parking lot design of Buckeye Motor Speedway, we decided to use the Hamilton County parking standards as opposed to the Madison County parking standards where the track is located. The reason for that was Hamilton County has many more stadiums and arenas located in it, which makes it more relevant to our situation. For our track, the maximum capacity is 110,000 people, which required us to provide 37,000 parking spaces for the guests, which is one for every three guests. 37,000 spaces are separated into multiple different lots. Here in the navy blue, the asphalt paved parking lots can be seen. The priority for handicap parking for the track is to the west of the track in the green and allows for 5,600 spaces. Main general parking areas are in the light blue and use a lead accredited material called grass creek and allows for 32,100 spaces. The 32,100 spaces is based on 135 spaces per acre in an open lot. Main general parking area part. The total parking availability for the track came out to be 37,700 spaces, which exceeded the amount needed by 700 spaces. The hotel and casino requires 1,350 additional parking spaces. Here in the pink is the hotel casino parking lot, which allows for 650 spaces. The extra 700 spaces provided by the track parking lot allow for overflow parking for the hotel and casino here in the red. The lot to the north of the track in the yellow is a NASCAR merchandise lot not used for guest parking. This is the main paved parking lot for the track, which is for priority and handicap parking. There's an entrance coming from the south, seen here. Another entrance from the north, seen here. The area in the yellow is for handicap parking and is located closest to the entrance and allows for 390 spaces, which is obtained from the ADA standards. The main paved to hotel and casino parking lot, this is the main parking lot for the hotel and casino. The area seen in yellow is for handicap parking and allows for 24 spaces. The area in the navy is a drop-off area for people's luggage. Here is the only entrance seen from the east. Next, I will be talking about pavement design. The goal of pavement design is to find a cost-effective pavement that is safe and durable for the given conditions. Some things that were taken into consideration were the traffic that would be on the roads on a daily basis, the amount of that traffic that would be trucks, the environment, and also the soil characteristics of the land. The design of the pavement, the Ashdo or ODOT pavement design method was used. The Ashdo design method is based off a structural number which is calculated using the conditions off the previous slide. The structural number, also seen as SN, represents the overall structural requirement needed to sustain the design's traffic loading. Each component of the pavement has its own structural number associated with it. The idea is to have the design pavement structural number exceed the required pavement structural number that was calculated using a series of ODOT charts. To come up with the pavement's total structural number, the individual structural number of each layer of pavement needs to be multiplied by the number of inches that each layer consists of, seen here. The table shows how many inches of each layer of pavement were needed to have an adequate pavement. The final structural number of the design pavement was 4.22 which exceeded the required structural number of 3.9, therefore it works. Detail shows the pavement layers and their thicknesses. The pavement consists of 1.5 inches of asphalt concrete surface course on top of 2 inches of asphalt concrete intermediate course. Between those two layers, a layer of tack coat will need to be added to increase the strength. 
Below those two layers is six inches of asphalt concrete base. The final layer is four inches of aggregate base, which will need to be compacted using a roller, seen here. Next up will be Brian Asecki talking about the track and infield. Thank you, Tyler. So, Bucket Line Studio will, will be uh, 48 feet wide, consisting of three 16 foot lanes. The uh, transition from the banking of the curve to the straightaways is approximately 275 feet from the 26 degree outer turn to the 10 degree straightaways. Safer barriers will be installed in the outside and in the interior walls of the track. The safer barrier is actually a metal wall with 30 inches of styrofoam behind it that had the impact of the accident for driver safety. Uh, pit Road will contain 43 stalls, which will be 20 foot by 36 foot long, as the NASCAR uh, specification. Pit Road, the through road itself, will be asphalt with concrete stalls. The stalls will be concrete due to the sudden stopping and acceleration that occurs during a uh, NASCAR pit stop as well as for traction before the uh, pit crew that have to make the uh, tire changes. The infield will be um, um, asphalt for the haulers and also the RV parking. Um, the, there will be grass areas for uh, recreational vehicles for the fans to camp on in the infield as well. And there will also be safer barriers in the interior walls of the track to protect the fans. The, for the actual pavement design itself, there will be a 6 inch 3 or 4 compacted aggregate base, followed by a 2 inch open graded asphalt layer, and a 2 inch base layer, a 1.5 inch intermediate asphalt layer, and a 1.5 inch surface layer. <coughs> All four layers will have the same mixed properties. Um, we decided to use a PGA 8228 binder for its elastic properties, as well as SPS polymers to increase the durability of the track, uh, Sasso bit, which is actually a long chain hydrocarbon to uh, uh, lower the viscosity to make it easier to pave on the 26 degree banks, and also to uh, improve compaction to lower the air voids to help prevent uh, ruts occurring during the freeze thaw cycles of Ohio's lovely winters. Um, we also decided to use an 8722 polymer oil on the surface layer to again increase the elastic properties of the surface layer to uh, help contend with the uh, thermal and expansion and contraction due to seasonal changes. For pit road itself, we decided to use a 6 inch aggregate base with a 4 inch poured concrete layer. And for the three lanes, like I said before, we'll have uh, only three layers this time without the intermediate base layer. I would now like to turn it over to Don Wilson and the geotechnical team. Thank you, Brian. I'd like to begin by introducing our geotechnical team and what each member will be covering today. I will be covering an overview of solar properties and tunnel design, Andrew Bernhard, basement and hotel foundations, Dave Swanson, track embankment and retaining wall, and finally, Jeff Smith, who will be covering scoring tower and great stand foundations. We'd also like to give a special thanks to our mentor, Marshall Leader, for his help during this process. So what did the geotechnical team have, have to design? We first had to determine existing soil properties on site and determine <coughs> if it was uh, good for foundations. Uh, we had to determine a track embankment for, track embankment for the one mile track. We had to design the infield access tunnel to allow pedestrians and vehicles to safely enter and exit the infield. We had to come up with a basement which will house mechanical and laundry facilities for the track. A retaining wall located between the hotel and the track itself. And finally, three structures required to design of foundations, and those include the hotel, grandstand, and scoring towers. Shown here is an overview of our site from the U.S. Department of Agriculture's web soil survey. Seen in the orange lettering and orange squiggly lines are the various soils we have on site. Uh, Agri down to a depth of about five feet. Um, they consist mostly of silt loams and silty clay loams, which the significance of this is for drainage purposes and as sites that were covered earlier. Um, however, due to the fact that foundations rely on the strength of soil much further down than five feet in depth, it is further subsurface investigations need to happen. However, due to mon monetary constraints and the nature of our project, boring logs were not immediately available to the geotechnical team for this exact location. So to continue with the design, geo, the geotech team used flooring logs from another location with the assumption that the soil seen at that location also existed on our site. The tunnel design is 162 feet in length, 35 feet wide, and 20 feet 4 inches at its apex. The 35 feet span will offer two 12 foot vehicular lanes and two five-foot sidewalks that allow pedestrians to enter and exit uh, the infield safely. 
The tunnel will be constructed out of one foot thick precast concrete arches that get laid in six foot sections for a total of 27 sections. These sections will be placed on a six foot, six inch wide cast in place strip foundations that run the length of the tunnel that are two, two foot in thickness. The tunnel will also be gently sloped to the center to allow a 15 inch trench drain to take all rainwater out of the tunnel and move it into the detention basin talked about earlier. Now I'll hand it over to Dave Swanson to talk about track abatement and retaining the wall. Thanks, Don. As Don had just mentioned, part of our design was to design the abatements. For this, we wanted four major things out of it. We wanted it to be safe. We wanted it to last up to the rigors of a full NASCAR race. So we incorporated an over-design feature into every one of our calculations. We also wanted it to be fast, because after all, people go to NASCAR races to see cars driving fast. We wanted it to be competitive, so we wanted to open up more passing lanes. We wanted to see cars passing. We wanted to give the fans really their money's worth for this event. And we wanted it to be uh, modern. We wanted to make this track design last for many years to come and to kind of draw people because of its modernness. Um, to look at the effects of banking, we can see two currently Two current tracks. This here is Martinsville in Virginia. It's just more than a half a mile long, baked at 12 degrees, and has a design speed of about 100 miles an hour. This one is Bristol from Tennessee. It's same length, more than twice as banked, and has a speed 30 miles an hour greater. So from looking at these two, we can determine that the embankment equals speed. For our design, we chose a progressively banked design. In this, the embankment increases from the inside to the outside of the track. This allows for faster speeds along the outside and encourages racers to pass each other around the turns, which isn't typical of an NASCAR race. Uh, this embankment change will occur over three equal width lanes, and it's going to give us a design speed of about 160 miles an hour. Here's a representation of it. You can see it increases from 20, 23 to 26 degrees over three 16-foot sections. <laughs> the straightaways are going to be aimed straight at 10 degrees, and it's going to be 48 feet wide also. And this won't increase the speed, but it will minimize the transition between the straightaways and the turns. Here's another representation of our straightaway. Part of our design was also to design a retaining wall. The, as it sits right now, the hotel is about 75 feet away from the track. So the, that's the hotel balcony. And there's a 12 foot elevation difference from the bottom of the hotel to the top of the track. The putting in a uh, chaining wall would create more usable space and would also reduce soil pressure on the hotel. As this picture shows, it's going to extend past the length of the hotel and uh, it slopes at the same angle as the outside walls of the hotel. This is a cross-sectional view of it as it is right now. You can see the earthen fill between the track and the hotel. And by adding a retaining wall, it will create that much more usable space and reduce the pressure. That wall is going to be cast in place concrete, it's steel reinforced, and it has granular backfill to, pro to provide drainage and to reduce standard <coughs> pressure. Now I'd like to hand it over to Andrew to talk about basement design and hotel foundations. Thank you, David. In order to provide full services to the patrons at the uh, hotel and casino, we have designed a basement to house two separate rooms, a laundry room and a camper room. The laundry room is 130 by 52 feet, totaling 6,750 square feet. And the camper room is 164 feet by 52 feet, totaling for 8,528 square feet. The mechanical room will house air conditioning, ventilation, and uh, heating, as well as provide plumbing and electrical services. The laundry room will of course have us washing and drying. In order to adequately design for the basement, we had to take in, uh, to account bearing pressure. Bearing pressure is the pressure on the wall in place by the soil or any water in the soil. Uh, after designing and calculating, we analyzed that the pressures will be 617.4 pounds per square foot and 3,264.1 pounds per square foot. For the basement design, we have a 15-foot depth basement with a concrete floor, which is one foot thick and reinforced with steel. The concrete walls are seven and a half inches thick based on ACI code minimums 
and we have 36 footings to support the basement. Uh, 12 of the footings are 10 and a half by 10 and a half by four and a half feet, and the other 24 are four, four foot two inches by four foot two inches, and two feet three inches thick. Both, uh, all of the footings have steel reinforcement for flexural, uh, for flexural reinforcement, and are number 10 bars. Uh, the number 10 bar means that it has a diameter of 1.27 inches, and that increasing numbers means it has a thicker diameter, and smaller numbers mean it has a thinner diameter. For the hotel foundation, 78 footings were used. These consist of nine feet by nine feet and four, foot in, or four feet thick uh, foundations. 15 number 10 bars were used each way at seven inches on center to provide flexural reinforcement, and four number 10 dowels were used for torsional uh, reinforcement. The max loading for the uh, design was a factored axial load of 2,214.9 kips and a factored moment of 1,700 1,727.6 kit feet. Now I'd like to hand it over to Jeff Smith with Scoring Tower and Grandstand Foundations. Thank you, Andrew. The Scoring Tower is located in the infield and is a 60 foot high tower that allows for patrons to view the position of their race car driver during the race. For foundation design purposes, Dimensions came out to be six foot by six foot by 18 inch square spread footing. These dimensions were acquired by applying the following loads provided by the structural team to the design process. Also, no foundation is complete without structural steel reinforcement. Flexural reinforcement of steel were required because of the brittle nature of concrete, which is extremely strong under compression, but does not naturally resist bending. It should also be noted that we had very good soil conditions based on the soil boring log provided. Uh, this aided in the design process as when you have strong soil, uh, requires a less complicated foundation design. The diagram here shows the three forces to consider when designing a form foundation. From left to right, you have axial loading, followed by torsional loading, and then followed by flexional loading. Here you can see the final design of the foundation. You can see the L-shaped dowels for torsional reinforcement and the straight bars extending both ways throughout the foundation for flexural reinforcement. Because of the scoring tile is a steel structure and our foundation is concrete, the base plate connection was required. You can see two three-quarter inch bolts on either side of the foundation extending 13 inches into the concrete. Also, a half inch, two inch thick grout buffer to seal the three quarter inch steel thick base plate into the concrete. Moving along to the grandstand foundation, this was a very similar design as the scoring tires foundation, and the following dimensions were achieved. Again, these were based on the loadings seen here provided by the structural team. <coughs> and again, flexural and torsional reinforcement were required. I'd also like to note that the soil conditions, again, were very similar to those at the Scoring Tower site and, again, aided in the foundation design. <coughs> Seen here is a strip footing. Um, this is normally ideal for a structure like grandstands, where many footings are in such close proximity that they may be connected, as seen. However, a square spread footing seen here was chosen after the design process permitted it, saving concrete and steel, which ultimately saved money as there are many foundations for uh, the grandstands. The final design for the grandstand foundation is shown here. The, the main difference between this foundation and the square tower foundation is that the square tower foundation had a steel structure connecting to a concrete foundation. The structural team in designing their grandstand columns deemed them to be two inch, or excuse me, two foot in diameter concrete columns. So the geotechnical team decided to just extend these down into the base of the concrete plane, <coughs> therefore cutting out the need for connection to the foundation. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank you all for sitting through the first half of the presentation, and please join us for a brief 15-minute intermission outside the theater for refreshments.
Hi, my name is Andrew Dorfler. I would like to welcome you back to my foundation. I am one of the freshmen. I am the structural team leader, and I would first like to start by introducing my team members. Um, I will be talking about the overview and scope of work for the structural design team. Leah Briscoe will be covering gravity loads and slab design. Robin Brown will be talking about lateral loads, beam, and column design. Tim McFarlane will be speaking about lower level grandstand design. Ed Farrell will be covering the upper level grandstand. Long Zing Dong will be covering Interstate 71 overpass. Ralph Alsai will be covering scoring tower design. I'd also like to extend a special thank you to our mentor, Ben Vandaway, for all his help this semester. For our structural scope of work this year, we had four major items, um, all of them pretty extensive. First was the checkered flag hotel and casino, pictured below. Uh, it's located on the east side of the track, and we proposed a steel frame for this, which, which creates a light, strong structure with a masonry menu. And Robin and Leo will be speaking about that later. Our next major scope item were the track grandstands, totaling seating of about 110,000 fans with a, utilizing upper and lower track, or lower sections. The upper section is a steel frame, just like the hotel, and the lower section is a slab on the road <coughs> built into the side of the track, that, built into the side of the hill um, that sites have split out over there. The final two portions of our scope of work were the Interstate 71 overpass, which needed to be expanded from the existing two lanes to the five lane overpass, and a scoring tower that you can see pictured there, um, that is used for the drivers, or for the fans to know where the drivers are at throughout the entire race. I'd also like to cover some of the codes we use that you can hear in reference throughout our presentation. The first is ASC 7-05, which was used to find all of our design loading. The ICC 300-12 code, which is used for grandstand design. Um, it's referenced from the uh, Ohio building code. ACI 318-11, which is the American Concrete Institute, uh, it's all concrete requirements. And the AISC 14th edition steel construction manual, which was used to find all of our student members for all of our, uh, for all of our uh, structures. Next, I would like to introduce Leah Briscoe. She will be talking about gravity loads and size. considered when designing a structure, a gravity load is any downward force caused by the weight of an object. In designing our hotel, we considered three gravity loads. There were live loads, dead loads, and roof loads. A live load is any movable or non-permanent part of the structure, such as people or furniture. A dead load is any permanent part of the structure. And a roof load is any load caused by weather, such as rain and snow loading. ASC 7-5 was used as the minimum design standard for all of the loads. <coughs> in order to size the beams for the hotel, live loading was first considered. We determined the area on each floor that required the largest live load and applied this over the entire floor for efficiency of design. As you can see in the red box um, is the design live load for each floor, and the pink box is the area of each floor that determined the live load. Our next gravity load considered was dead loads. Um, three components were considered in the dead loading. This was ceilings, which consisted of the mechanical and electrical work. Floors, which consisted of the concrete slab, carpet, and tile. And walls, which consisted of the interior steel studs with gypsum board and the windows, glass, and frame. From these components, we determined the total dead load to be 100 pounds per square foot per floor. Our last gravity load considered was the roof loads. Um, first, the snow load we determined to be 25 pounds per square foot. Um, then for the rain loads, we didn't determine a rain load value because it was included in the given dead load of the green roof, which was based on a fully saturated soil. Based on these two components, the total dead load of 165 pounds per square foot was determined for the roof loading. Once the loads were determined, we were able to size a slab for the hotel. We chose a hollow core floor, floor slab. Um, this was chosen based on its simplicity to design and efficiency to install because it saved on um, forms because it comes in a pre-poured slab. 
<coughs> we chose an 8 by 26 foot clear span. This was chosen based on our beam layout and it minimized the amount of columns necessary in the open space in the bottom floor casino. Based on this clear span, a 216 pounds per square foot allowable load was given. We also used a three inch structural concrete cover on top of our slab. This is because the hollow core floor slabs come free stressed with a slight peak in the center. Um, the three inch cover allows for a flat and seamless floor surface for our hotel. Next is Robin Brown rig with lateral loads and beam design. Thank you, Leah. When we design the steel beam, we must first determine how large the load is and how the load is going to be applied. Once this is determined, we can begin the design process. The design of the steel beam is controlled by one of two criteria, the bending moment and or deflection. First, let me explain how to calculate the bending moment. Start with a distributed load that is formed by applying the dead and live loads Leo mentioned earlier across an area or a length. Next, we have the tributary area, which is the area directly supported by the member. The tributary area can vary throughout the structure based on the layout. Next, we have a moment. A moment is defined as a force times a distance. A simple example of a moment would be imagine a wrench. You apply a force on the wrench with your hand a certain distance away from a bolt. That force times the distance creates a moment turning the bolt. When a force is applied to a beam, it will bend due to the moment created at each end of the beam. The goal is to limit the amount the beam will bend by selecting the size based on the plastic section modules. The minimum required plastic section modules is calculated based on the moment, length of the beam, the load, and the yield strength of the steel. It is defined as the sum of the cross-sectional area about the neutral axis or the point in the member where the forces acting on the beam are zero. The hotel was designed using I-beams from which the section modulus has been calculated for every size by the American Institute of Steel Construction. Therefore, we can use the AISC manual to select the most economical size that meets or exceeds the minimum requirement. Second floor, which contains the conference rooms, restaurant, and deck, is comprised of 206 beams. The third, fourth, and fifth floors, where the hotel rooms are located, each floor will be made up of 161 beams, which will include the beams you see here highlighted in red that will support the balconies for the guest rooms facing the track. Finally, we have the roof, will, which will be comprised of 145 beams and will support the green roof, which will be discussed later. Next, <coughs> this table represents the range of beams selected for the hotel. The first number refers to the depth, while the second refers to the weight. So the largest beam is 30 inches deep and 108 pounds per foot. Next, we have the range of columns selected for our hotel. First, to size of column, we first need the load that is being applied to the beam. And this load will then be transferred horizontally along the length of the beam, creating a vertical load, which is used to select a column size based on the compressive strength. Structural steel for the hotel will be connected using three-quarter inch bolts. The number of bolts per connection will vary based on the beam size and the loading applied. The red, red element you see here in example will be the four inch by four inch by one quarter inch angle that will vary in length based on the number of bolts required. Before I discuss the structural analysis that was performed, I'd like first like to thank Dr. Tubia for providing the uh, Strand 7 software that was used. What you're looking at here is the center section of the hotel and the deflection created by a lateral load being applied. The lateral load is comprised of seismic or wind forces acting on structure. The seismic load in this example is being applied to the front of the hotel, which is facing you and trying to push it away from you. As for the different colors you see, blue represents less than one half of an inch of deflection, and the pink is showing a five to six inch deflection. The reason there is a five to six inch def deflection is due to the fact that there is no concrete floor slab in the model. And the concrete floor slab will provide more than enough rigidity or stiffness to reduce the deflection. Next, I'd like to turn it over to Tim McFarland to discuss lower grades and design.
Thank you, Robin. For those of us who aren't very familiar with NASCAR, the upper level seating is considered to be more desirable due to fans having a complete view of their favorite drivers at any given point on the track. Since these seats are preferable, ticket costs are higher, while the lower level seating is considered to be the cheaper tickets. The lower level grandstand has been designed to accommodate approximately 61,000 fans. In order to satisfy the requirements of the Americans with Disabilities Act, the lower grandstand contains 350 seats reserved for handicapped fans, which are evenly distributed in order to provide viewing opportunities equivalent to those who are not in a wheelchair. This drawing of the front elevation of the typical section illustrates the general layout of the lower grandstand. The area highlighted in green represents uh, the handicapped seating area with four feet in depth and three feet in width reserved for a fan. The area which is highlighted in blue represents the access aisles for fans to get to and from their designated seats. These aisles are four feet wide and consist of seven inch intermediate steps for less strenuous climbing. The handrail has a gap every eight feet to allow fans to access their seats on either side of the aisle with minimal disruption of surrounding spectators. The lower grandstand is primarily a reinforced concrete structure consisting of approximately 15,000 cubic yards of concrete and approximately 970,000 linear feet of reinforcing steel. That's over 183 miles of steel that each, base, each piece was laid out in a straight line. All the reinforced concrete was designed according to the American Concrete Institute's ACI 318-11, which is considered to be the national standard. The structure itself is built into an earthen embankment, which can be constructed from all the soil excavated from the track and the infield. The seats themselves were chosen to be aluminum bleachers with backrests and steel connections in order to lower construction costs, which are directly reflected in the ticket prices. 18 inches of each bleacher is reserved for ticket holding, which equivocates to 1,040 seats per section. Galvanized steel handrails were chosen rather than aluminum due to aluminum's natural reactivity with the alkalizing concrete, which could cause it to crack. Reinforcing steel is embedded in concrete for three primary reasons. Although it is very strong when subject to compression, concrete is weak when subject to tension. In addition, concrete has very low ductility which is defined as a material's ability to visibly deform before failure. The final reason, which was the controlling factor for the Buckeye Motor Speedway, is that reinforcing steel prevents concrete from cracking due to freezing and thawing conditions. Chapter 7.12 from ACI 318-11 indicates that shrinkage and temperature reinforcement used to prevent excessive cracking from freezing and thawing conditions must meet the required minimum area of 0 0.0018 times the gross area of the concrete for which it is to reinforce. It also indicates that the maximum space between consecutive bars is limited to five times the thickness of the concrete, but not more than 18 inches on center. This drawing illustrates the reinforcement of the concrete from a profile view of the structure. The areas highlighted in green represent the footings, which prevent the structure from sliding in towards the track and infield. These continuous features consist of number five longitudinal bars spaced at 18 inches on center, with number four transverse bar speaks at 18 inches on center. The area highlighted in blue represents a typical portion of the step structure, which is reinforced with number five longitudinal bars at 18 inches on center in each stair, and number four longitudinal bars at 12 inches on center along the bottom slab portion. Both the stair and the slab also consist of number four transverse bars at 18 inches on center. Located between the upper and lower grandstands are a total of 60 luxury suites each equipped with a miniature kitchen, a bar, and optional, optional catering for you and your friends, family, or co-workers. This drawing provides a basic visual of a typical suite and its various accommodations. In addition to the luxury suites, a press box has been incorporated into our design for use by television and radio personnel. This press box is equipped with electrical, telephone, and internet connections to broadcast the excitement live across the entire nation. This final drawing provides a basic visual of the layout of the press box and its accommodations for media personnel. Now here's Ed Farrell to talk about the upper grandstands. Thank you, Tim. The upper level grandstands will consist of 94 total sections, with 47 upper level sections and 47 lower level sections respectively. 
62 of these sections will span along the straightaway of the track, with an additional 16 sections angled along both turns of the track. Typical section of seating consists of 24 rows with 21 individual seats per row, totaling 504 seats per section. Compliance with ADA requirements and additional three handicap seats will be included in each section. At 507 seats per section and 94 total sections, the upper grandstands will hold approximately 47,000 seats. The stands will consist of a series of 12 foot high, 2 foot wide, circular reinforced concrete columns. The steel frame of the grandstands will be bolted atop these columns. The steel frame is raised in this manner as to allow adequate height for underlying suites and concessions. Finally, a prefabricated aluminum decking system will be welded atop the steel frame. The loads considered for the grandstands were calculated via ASC 7-05. In addition to these calculated loads, the Ohio Building Code specifies the use of the International Code Council for grandstand design. The ICC specifies a live load of 100 pounds per square foot. In addition, horizontal sway loads defined as the sudden and concerted motion of spectators must be considered. These sway loads can occur parallel to seating at 24 pounds per lineal foot or perpendicular to seating at 10 pounds per lineal foot. In designing the frame of the grandstands, a representative section was chosen for analysis due to the immense number of steel members and the repetitiveness of the frame. To analyze this section, a three-dimensional frame was drawn to SAP 2000 finite element analysis software. The first step within the software was to define initial or trial members. These members included steel columns, breaker or stringer beams, which are the beams that carry the direct dead and live load from the aluminum decking, horizontal bracing members, cross bracing or diagonal X bracing members, and finally horizontal beams which are not shown in this plane of view. After these initial members were defined, the loads and load combinations were manually entered into SAP 2000. Load combination that controlled the majority of the members was the ICC specified parallel sway load seen here. The animation is an exaggerated look at how the parallel sway load will deform the frame of the grandstands. The program now run, each individual member can be analyzed and determined for strength and deflection requirements. Multiple iterations were run within the program and various layouts and member sizes were considered. With the use of SAC 2000, we were able to design an economically efficient model. In total, 6,400 tons of steel will be used to design the upper level grain stakes. Now here's Long Zing to talk about the overpass bridge design. Thank you, Alan. In order to accommodate the increasing traffic at the NASCAR Stadium Red Bull, the overpass bridge on State Road 56 was suspended. The overpass bridge passed over I 71 and is used to connect London Super Wheel Road, which goes over I 71. The, the overpass bridge is made of reinforced concrete. It contains five lanes, two shoulders. The bridge is 68 feet wide. 350 feet long and 25 feet high. Joint show below is a top row of the bridge. To design the bridge, the term the design loads is very important. The land load is determined by the heavy tracks. We assume the bridge only carries heavy tracks during the heavy traffic turn to get a maximum land load. That load is determined by the weight of the bridge. Wind load is determined by the wind speed and the surface pressure of the fire. Snow load is calculated by the quantity of snow and the surface which carries the snow. Sensing load is caused by the vibration of the structures during the earthquake. The magnitude of the sensing load depends on the weight of the bridge and the power of the earthquake. I'll fish all the load calculations by using the load calculation to get a maximum design load. The design load for the overpass bridge is between 4,000 and 500 feet long caps. The bridge contains four pier caps, 16 columns, 65 beams, and the third slabs. This is the side view of the bridge. This is the front view of the overpass bridge. From top to bottom, there are button rail, slab, beam, pure cap, and column. As Tim mentioned before, concrete is strong in compression and weak in tension. 
still rats are at a potential site in the at Tinshaw Jones and Concrete. As shown, as the drawing shown below, where the force comes from the top of the beam, the tension stress region will be located at the bottom beam. So usually, steel bars are added at the bottom of the beam to improve the tension stress of the concrete. These drawings are the front view of the beam and the pier cap and the top view of the column. Steel bars are the bottom to resist the tension, and the steel bars to run the steel bars to improve the shear stress of the concrete. These are the top view and the side view of the steel bars. The steel bars are the bottom to help improve the potential stress of the concrete. Connections in the bridge are used to connect each part of the bridge, which includes the guardrail, slab, beam, pier cap, and column. We choose to use number 11 steel bars uh, to as our uh, to as the connections that hold the bridge. These joints are the design of the connections. Next, roughly we'll introduce the scoring target down. Thank you, Mark. First of all, the scoring tower will, will let the fans know where the drivers are, and then we'll be posting the rankings all throughout the race. The structure will measure 60 feet, with the top where the column being split into four equal 15 foot columns. There's a beam connecting each corner of the, top of the, of the structure to the column. On each side, there's going to be six beams uh, spaced 10 feet apart from each other, connecting the column to all three corners. After during the live and dead loads, we decided the lightest and most efficient size for our column would be an HSS 20 by 105. For those who don't know what HSS is, it's basically hollow steel tube, which in our case would, be, would have a diameter of 20 inches, spanning 60 feet. Using the ASCE 7-05, all other loads affecting our tower, which include wind loads, snow loads, seismic loads, and ice loads, were all determined. After checking the value for actual bending moment and the maximum allowable bending moment, we are sure that our design is, a, is an acceptable one. The table here shows each of the calculated, each of the calculated loads. You can see each type of loading along with its, with its value. Designed the loads with 836 TL, we, we calculated the determined minimum size, the design strength per inch, and the required length of the loads, which are also above. <coughs> For a bolt's design, we determined that each group of four bolts will have to carry a load of 7.5 kips. The diameter of the bolt and the bearing strength spacing are also shown above. We determined that the best size for our beam would be W6 by 25 beam. And we're going to, uh, as I said earlier, we have, there's going to be six beams on each corner of the tower, spaced 10 feet apart from each other. The design is an adequate design after checking with bending, shear, and deflection, and making sure that the actual, the actual value is smaller than the maximum value. Also, the beams will have to carry a load of 7.5 pips while being designed to actually carry a load of 25 pips. And now, here's Kathy Jungman with the environmental group. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. I am the group leader for the environmental team, and today I will talk about the LEED certification process for the Checkered Flag Hotel and Casino. The other members of the environmental team include Ken Myers, who will talk about rainwater <coughs> management, Mariana Abujaudi, who will discuss some of the environmental concerns concerns that were factored into our design, and Michael Mara, who will discuss the on-site wastewater treatment. We would also like to thank our mentor, Professor Nadia Turek. The goal of the environmental team for this project was to ensure the safety of our visitors while also minimizing environmental harms associated with the new development. By incorporating environmentally friendly building components, the Checkered Flag Hotel and Casino has the potential to earn a LEED Silver certification. LEED stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design and is an organization that was founded by the United States Green Building Council in order to promote and recognize green building practices. There are four different certification levels based on the number of points earned. As I stated before, the Checkered Flag Hotel and Casino has the potential to achieve a minimum of 50 LEED points, which is a silver rating. 
NEED is comprised of multiple rating systems for different types of projects. The latest version, NEED version 4, was used at the hotel and casino. NEED version 4 for new construction contains eight different categories, each encompassing different components of green building, and range from site location to energy and water use to the sustainable selection of materials and interior fixtures. <coughs> As you can see, credits were earned in each of the different categories at the Checkered Flag Hotel and Casino for a total of 50 points. A wide variety of credits were earned for this project. Shown on the screen is a brief overview of some of the credits that were earned. Measures were taken to improve rainwater runoff quality and quantity and will be discussed in further detail by Ben Myers. In addition, outdoor light fixtures in the parking lots were selected to reduce the amount of light pollution generated on site. Light pollution is the addition of artificial light into the night sky and is harmful to certain ecosystems. By selecting light fixtures that direct the majority of the light downwards, the amount of light pollution is reduced and energy is conserved, while still ensuring that the parking lot is safely lit. The environmental team also paid special focus to reducing water use on site through low flow restroom fixtures and a water reclamation system, which will be discussed later in the presentation by Mike Mara. Finally, recommendations were provided for the selection of interior fixtures and materials in order to ensure that recycling and material reuse was used whenever possible for this project. I would now like to introduce Ben Myers to talk about rainwater management. Thank you, Kathy. An extensive green roof was designed for the roof of the hotel. Extensive green roofs are composed of plants, soil, and a drainage layer. Green roofs provide many benefits, including reduced rainwater runoff volumes, improved rainwater runoff quality, increased habitat for insects, and increased building insulation. Seed of species and a poor substrate will be used in the hotel green roof. Seed and species require little maintenance and are very durable plants that are suited well for a wide range of weather conditions. A drainage layer is designed in the event of a large storm producing more rainfall than the green roof plants and substrate can absorb. The green roof is sloped so that the water flows through the drainage layer to the vertical roof drains. A waterproofing layer is used under the drainage layer to protect the roof and prevent leaks. The next measure of rainwater management considered was alternative parking considerations. We chose Bowenite Grass Creek for all the auxiliary non-pavement parking lots. It is a pervious concrete pavement that is continuously reinforced to provide superior structural integrity. Some of the benefits of Grass Creek are that the stormwater infiltration rate of Grass Creek is roughly the same as an ordinary lawn. Thus, detention basins were not needed besides an infield of the track. The strength of the concrete increased the stability and erosion control of the parking lots and enhanced aesthetics compared to a paved parking lot. This is a cross section of the grass grid. Some of the contents include a two inch granular subbase of three quarter inch aggregate, a one inch layer of sand, a quarter inch diameter rebar reinforcement, 16 inch on center. The trapezoid is the molded pulp former, which are made from 100% ripe recycled paper. It is the heart of the grass grate and the strength comes from it as well as the concrete. The mixed concrete design, I'll talk more about this, talk more, talk about this in more detail in a second, and a one-inch cover. The chart above is the mixed concrete design and the chart below is the rebar reinforcement loading table. The water is important because it helps the workability of the concrete. And to completely utilize the tension strength of the rebar, the concrete needs to mold around the rebar tightly. The air and training admixture provides small voids in the concrete, which allows a place for water to go and will help the durability of the concrete in freezing thaw conditions of Ohio. In number two, rebar reinforcement, 60 inch on center, will be able to support 45,500 pounds of load 28 days after it is constructed. And next will be Mariana speaking about environmental considerations. Thank you, Ben. The environmental considerations discussed today will be in noise abatement and stormwater quality. To put sound levels produced by NASCAR races into perspective, 
Ear protection is recommended starting at 85 decibels. A 1976 Who concert at the Valley, which is a sports stadium in London, produced a sound level of 120 decibels. Noise becomes painful at 125 decibels. The December 2013 Seattle Seahawks game against the New Orleans Saints produced a sound level of 138 decibels. A NASCAR race in Bristol, Tennessee surpassed all of these with a record sound level of 140 decibels. Based on the registered peak sound levels, we recommend that in order to prevent hearing loss, fans should wear personal ear protection. The designs of the bleachers and track will help reduce sound levels. The Bristol Motor Speedway, where the 140 decibel sound level was recorded, contains a track completely surrounded by bleachers, which contains the sound in the area. Buckeye Motor Speedway bleachers will not completely surround the track, will reflect the sound upward, and will include a fireproofing insulation that will help dissipate the sound. At the hotel, Homosote 440 Sound barrier insulation will be used in the westward walls of the hotel to have, help dissipate the incoming noise. Due to fuel and oil used in the stock cars of the NASCAR race, stormwater quality is a concern from either normal oil and fuel traces from the regular day at the racetrack or from major oil and fuel spills after a sorbent has been applied. As an extra layer of safety for the environment, we will be using three oil water separators in line with the storm sewers. They will be placed between the pit area and the detention basin. A traditional oil water separator works by using baffles and density differences to block rising oil and hydrocarbons, as well as settling particulates consisting of metals and soils. The hydrocarbons are then removed using a weir at the top of the basin. A typical oil water, or oil water separator like this will move oil droplets larger than 150 microns in diameter down to a concentration of 50 parts per million. Instead of a traditional oil water separator, we recommend using the CSI below grade oil water separator from containment solutions for more effective removal. We will need three oil water separators with a 10 foot diameter set in parallel to be able to handle the peak influent flow coming from the trench basins in the, in the pit area. An oil water separator like this can remove uh, droplets with a size of 20 microns in diameter and will produce a maximum effluent of approximately 10 parts per million. The secret to success of an oil water separator like this is the use of coalescent media. Coalescent media takes dispersed oil and water droplets and combines them and filters them out. This oil water separator works by introducing the influent from the top of the trench, uh, on top of the basin, allowing the flow to carry the oil water mix through the coalescing media. The effluent then exits through the top of the uh, through, through the top of the oil water separator. Next is Micomera with on-site wastewater treatment. Thank you, Marion. Because our site location is not near any major cities or wastewater treatment facilities, we were tasked with providing on-site wastewater treatment for Buckeye Motor Speedway, the hotel casino, and the campground facility. A permit to install is required by Ohio Revised Codes when installing any wastewater treatment facility. Here's the overall site layout. As discussed earlier by the site civil team, the puddle of water storage is located northwest of the track and will be used for drinking fountains, showers, sinks, and kitchen fixtures in the campground facility, stadium facilities, the infield facilities consisting of the driver's lounge and hospital, and the hotel casino. After usage, the water will flow into the wastewater treatment plant and then be pumped to the reclaimed water storage for reuse. Reclaimed water storage is located south of the track and will be used for toilet use only. The reclaimed water storage will flow by gravity from the reclaimed water storage facility to the toilets in the campground or stadium facility, into the campground, into the infield facilities, and into the hotel. Because the hotel will be in use all year, we will have a separate sanitary pipe 
for the hotel to the treatment facility. In case the 500,000 gallon reclaimed water storage facility reaches capacity, we will have an 8 inch perforated pipe that will slowly drain the water out into the swamp. Our design criteria and daily further flow rate for race days will be approximately 1.1 million gallons per day. 0.4 of that total will be from toilets alone. In addition, we will have an off-season daily flow rate of around 0.3 million gallons per day. With this reuse system, we will save over 400,000 gallons a day on race days and 80,000 gallons during the off-season. At 0.53 cents per gallon, we will save over $200,000 per year with this reuse system. And have a return on investment in five years with the system costing approximately $1 million. Here's a look at our treatment process. It will begin with fine screens to get rid of large debris. The wastewater will then travel into equalization basins to contain the peak flows on race day. It will then travel to the splitter box to ensure equal flow to the membranes. Then to the anoxic zone, which will pump air into the water and biologically oxidize it into CO2, nitrate, and water. It will then be converted into the aerobic zone, where the nitrate will be converted into nitrogen and CO2. Next, the wastewater will flow into the membrane bioreactor treatment uh, to be filtered through submerged fibers. It can be recirculated back to the splitter box if the water is not adequate. Finally, it will be disinfected and color will be added with ozone and ultrafiltration to then be pumped back to the uh, stadium, hotel, and campground for toilet use. Our MBR treatment will be the GE Z-Mod L package plan. It comes on a pre-assembled skid for easy installation. We will use the Z-Mod 500 reinforced ultrafiltration membranes. Uh, these effectively block and remove particles, bacteria, viruses, cysts, and they're from the water supply. The maximum daily flow for the system will be 0.4 for off-season and 1 MGD for race days. In addition, the achievable effluent characteristics are well below EPA and Ohio standards. Here's a layout of what the general GE treatment system will look like. Here's a copy of the same system. As you can see from the image, there are two paths for the wastewater. One will be used during the off-season, and the second path will be open on race days to contain the peak demands. Now we'll turn it over to the project managers, Paul and Anna, to conclude the presentation with the final cost estimate. Thank you, Mike. As you can see, this project presented some unique challenges, such as the size of the project, and the unique requirements to meet NASCAR standards. The goal of any large-scale engineering project is to design something feasible from both an economic and engineering standpoint. To cover the engineering aspect, now we'd like to examine the economic side. In order to keep the design process on task and on schedule, we utilize the scheduling capabilities of Microsoft Project. As you can see in this example portion, we were able to break each item's scope of work out and assign a duration to each of the individual tasks. This helped us track what, if anything, was behind and how that impacted the rest of the project and our eventual end date. Our team was first introduced to this year's capstone design project in October during our fall semester. This graph displays the amount of total hours worked each month since we were first given the project. As you can see, a lot of time needed to be put into this project for it to be completed. There were three phases during our project. Architectural phase lasted from October through December. During this phase, a handful of students worked on designing a basic layout for our site to be used in later phases. The design phase began at the start of the spring semester in January and lasted through March. This is where all the engineering work was conducted. Finally, this last week and a half of April consisted of the review phase of our project. Reports, drawings, calculations were all reviewed in order to ensure adequacy. This graph displays the amount of hours worked by each individual team, as well as an average hours per team member breakdown. As you can see by the breakdown of hours per member, each team had an ample amount of work to be completed given their team size. 
In order to produce a realistic engineering cost estimate, accurate hourly wages needed to be set. With the help of our mentor, we were able to produce wages that represented typical engineering rates from the Dayton area while incorporating overhead and profit. The wages are as follows. Senior project managers, Anna and I, were billed at $175 per hour. Senior design engineers, which are the group leaders, were billed at $125 an hour. Project engineers were billed at $85 an hour, staff engineers at $65, and designers at $55 per hour. Team members were arbitrarily assigned a position under the last three sections. The Microsoft data Access database produced by a previous year's class was utilized in recording every hour worked by this year's capstone design class. These hours were then placed in an Excel spreadsheet. The spreadsheet was used to break down the hours worked by month, team, and individual member. Our class worked a, a total of 4,100 billable hours, which equates to about 137 hours per engineer. Utilizing the wages I Utilizing the wages I mentioned before, a total engineering cost was produced. This year's capstone team's total engineering cost is approximately $382,000. Monthly invoices for engineering fees can be found in the project manager's report, which is located up here on the stage. This is a comparison of each team's individual engineering costs. These costs accurately represent each team's scope of work, engineering requirements, and team size. This is why groups such as transportation, site civil, and structural accumulated much of the cost. Two things are important during construction, the schedule and the bottom line. We wanted to produce somewhat realistic estimates for both our schedule and our engineer's estimate. So based on the scope of each of the individual components, and with the understanding that several of these items would be under construction simultaneously, the estimated duration from groundbreaking to opening day of our complex is approximately three and a half years. With the help of our mentor, we also put, produced a construction estimate. As with the schedule, the estimate was broken down by major scope items. Due to the fact that the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing, as well as finishes such as paint and flooring, were not part of the design scope, in order to come up with realistic numbers that would incorporate these items, Square foot prices for the hotel, garages, hospital, and operations building were developed using RS means. The cost of the grandstand, site, and transportation improvements were developed using the quantity estimates arrived at during design. The total cost of the project, as you can see here, was $419.2 million, with over $310 million of that coming from the grandstands and site work alone. This graph shows a breakdown of the major scope items by percent of the total. As you can see, the grandstands, site, and transportation improvements were the largest components of the cost. So, with the engineer's estimate for construction and the engineering cost accrued during design, the total cost estimate for the Buckeye Motor Speedway Complex is $419.6 million. On behalf of the entire senior civil class, we'd like to thank those of you who are still awake this morning for coming. <laughs> this project represents months of hard work from everyone, and we're extremely happy to uh, be able to say that we're done. We, <laughs> we'd also like to thank Dr. Don Chase and the rest of the civil faculty for all of their help and support, not just during the project, but for the rest of the engineering, or our engineering education. Um, We'd also like to thank Karen Barrett and Beth Lasco, who are um, frequently of huge help to us. Um, we tireless help and support with the tedious things like report printing and plotter. Uh, tech support are invaluable for projects like this. Um, now we'd like to introduce uh, the head of the department, Dr. Don Chase, who would like to say a few words. Thank you, Anna. So you can see there's a little bit more involved in uh, building a NASCAR track and just paving it over. So there's quite a bit of work, $419 million worth of that. Work. Actually, I'd like to just take a few minutes to offer my own personal thanks. Uh, I want to again thank, as Anna mentioned, I'd like to thank uh, Karen Barrett, uh, Ben Glasgow, and also the faculty of the Civil Engineering Department for their help not only in this project, but also for their help in mentoring these students over the entire four or five years that they have the co-op that they've been at the University of Dayton. I'd also like to thank the first year students, sophomores, and juniors for attending this morning. 
Uh, we've asked them to attend so that they can get some idea of what they would be seeing in the next couple of years. Juniors in particular will be seeing something of this scope of magnitude next year. I really, really wish to thank the parents and the families and the friends for showing up today. That is very, very important to our students. It's very, very important to me personally. And I know some of you travel long distances to arrive and be with us this morning. So I thank you very much for that. And most importantly, I want to thank the senior class of 2014. They put in, as you saw, a lot, a lot of work on this project, and it really, really shows. These guys worked hard. I, when I started off with this project, didn't quite know the scope. Uh, now I have a better sense of uh, what the scope is, but they've done the work admirably. And I really want to thank the seniors for the great job that they've done. This time I'd like to invite the group leaders out on stage. What we'll do is we'll spend a few minutes uh, entertaining, opening up uh, the floor to any questions you might have. Uh, when we're finished with the question and answer, answer session, I invite you to come up on stage and review the set of plan drawings and also the reports. You're welcome uh, to spend some time looking at that. So having said that, if anyone have any questions, you may fire away. nature of the team and uh, make recommendations for interior uh, options to improve not the lead rating. So the, the seniors were handcuffed a little bit by the nature of what they did in terms of how many lead points they could, could accumulate on the outside, so to speak. What level of work is You said it, I did I'm not sure on the exact magnitude of the earthquake. Um, you know, we used the 705 to get the voting off of that. And uh, I'm not sure if it specifies, I don't think it specifies like the magnitude of the earthquake for it. So we just have to load in that get out of that. And it's, um, it's based off regionals, your region that you're in. So, you know, if I'm in California, I have higher uh, size of building. Add to that, uh, different soils have different. They have classifications of A, B, C, and D. And I think E actually. <coughs> for how the soil transmits, uh, 
the seismic waves through the foundations into the buildings. And I think we had a seismic classification of seagull school. And that's how the went from there put together. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? So at $419 million, the uh, ticket price could be competitive with other half <laughs> <laughs> Well, actually, one of the things we kind of took into consideration when we were first uh, setting a baseline, what we wanted to get under, we set at about uh, $400 million. We based that on Kentucky Motor Speedway. Uh, theirs was built originally in 2000, and originally it only held, I think, half of what it does now, so it was around 50,000 people. And then that cost them around $200 million. And then after that, they had to do upgrades to their um, track to get the Sprint Cup. And then that increased their prices in 2006 and 2007 by, I think, $150 million. Yeah. So kind of like with inflation, we set a baseline of $400 million. But then certain costs come along, such as the grass trees and various other things that we had to take into consideration. Other questions? I, Alec, I think one of the juniors had a question on how in the world your current number can be lower. Now, this is a side issue question. For your current number, how did it uh, decrease after you added pavement compared to you know, just fields? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> The, the curve number actually decreased uh, because of the poor soil conditions that we had before. And uh, row crops generally don't uh, allow as much infiltration as the grass does. So when we replaced uh, the crops in the, on poor soil conditions with grass in the park, in the camping area, it allowed for a better infiltration rate, which reduced the curve number. And then when we added grass green on top of that, that also uh, has a much lower curve number than row crops in, with poor soil conditions. So we were able to actually reduce the curve number for the entire site, um, and it allowed us not to have any uh, uh, detention or anything like that. So. Thank you. Yes. Uh, if I remember correctly, your share cost was three hundred and eighty thousand. Is that yes. right? Yeah. Uh, in the profession, we estimate about eight percent construction cost, and engineering cost, which equates to uh, three point two million. Going forward as future engineers, we'll under, as we'll undersell our profession anymore than it already is. Yeah. <laughs> we have a tough time after getting money from clients for our yeah. services now. We come in at 10% of what you should be. We think to kill us. Yeah. Um, <laughs> number two, you use the word tip a lot, and we'll be able to find it as a thousand pounds. Keep that in mind. Thank you. And it's also important to note that uh, the, it, as Paul mentioned at the beginning of this morning's presentation, typically, the 450 Senior Capital Design course, we parallel some actual project that's either currently taking place or has recently taken place or is proposed uh, in the Dayton area. And our students at, at this juncture are not licensed professional engineers. This is one, there are four steps necessary to become a licensed professional engineer. One step is to uh, graduate from a credit program. Second step is to take the FBA exam, which all these folks will be doing uh, within the next, if they haven't already, within the next uh, couple of weeks. So, as the gentleman pointed out, that's also a consideration too, is the liability that we assume in our profession. People serving a profession, and uh, so there's a responsibility that goes along with that. We take that responsibility very seriously. Other questions or comments? Well, thank you so much this morning uh, for coming out. I really appreciate it. <laughs> we will see you next year. And again, welcome uh, upstage if you'd like to take a look at the plans and the documents.